Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. We have just been laughing and having the best time, and we we just met our brand new best friend. So we're so excited today to bring you our brand new best friend, Jane Jenkins Herlong. I'm going to give you a brief intro. I got to read this because she's just, she's amazing. Jane Jenkins Herlong is a serious XM humorist international best-selling award-winning author, professional singer, oh my gosh, this woman's speaking my language, recording artist and award-winning professional speaker who is a recent inductee into the prestigious Speakers Hall of Fame. And she's also the author of five best-selling books. You got to hear some of these titles. <laughs> Rhinestones on my flip-flops, Choosing Extravagant Joy in the Midst of Everyday Mess-Ups, Bury, we with my, bury me with my pearls and one of my favorites, what tatas teach us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> Welcome. We're so happy that you joined and us. Some of our tatas have larger lessons than others. Just to... <laughs> <laughs> That's why my book is like 20 pages. <laughs> oh, thank y'all very much, Mary Fran, which is a Southern name, Mary Fran. Oh, well, I was, and you'll appreciate this. I was named after my grandmoms. So whenever anybody says, well, do you prefer Mary or Mary Fran? I'm like, you got to use both names because I don't want either one of those women haunting me in my sleep. You got to <laughs> use both names. It's got to be Mary Fran. I'm not, I'm not taking off any old ladies. <laughs> That's good. We don't want to mess with them anyway. No, we'll mm -hmm, be getting no. honor even when you're not here. Christy, nice to meet you too, you beautiful thing, young oh. thing. Gosh, <laughs> do I so even remember? You. <laughs> I'm so glad we're talking to someone that has published more books than Mary Fran has. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, um, the as you all know on the speaker platform, and you all are speakers, and I can't wait to hear you all on the platform one day. We were just speaking of that. But mm -hmm. if you have a speech, you got a book, you know, so oh, my yeah. good friend, Larry Wingate, who lives out in Oklahoma, now in Arizona, said, write your book. So my very first book was called Bare Feet to High Heels. And it was my experience in the pageant world. And I made it to Miss America. And that's where the journey ended abruptly. But <laughs> um, and then the subtitle is you don't have to be a beauty queen to be a beautiful person. And it's just a lot of Southern humor. So you know, that was just a little fun thing to do. And then it seems like I got serious about it. My sister had breast cancer and she survived it. Um, and I wrote a book called What Tatas Teach Us. And it's using your anatomy in an analogy and it's life lessons. And I really use that to raise money for breast cancer. I gave a lot of those little books away. And then that led to Bury Me With My Pearls, which is dedicated to my mother. We were super, super close. And she passed away and it just wasn't funny. And then all of a sudden I got my funny back, you know, after you grieve. Yeah. And then, um, which led to this uh, rhinestones on my flip flops, which was my big contract with Hachette and this biblical women in their flip flops in my Southern stories. And to be out in a year is Tyndall signed me for sweet tea secrets from the deep fried South. Oh my gosh. And they want to. Yeah, and they want to call it humorous and heartfelt stories. And I said, sweetheart, you read it first. And then she called me back. She said, yeah, sassy and somewhat sacred. I said, yeah, that's more like it. Sassy. I love that. <laughs> Who's going to buy and humorous and heartfelt? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to hear that? I'll need some you know what? It, it, To me, the best humor has a little bit of a bite. Mm. It, it's just, it, it has to have a little bit of a bite. Otherwise it, it veers into that kind of sentimentality stuff. Oh, I, I, I ain't got time for that. I, yeah. I just, I don't have time well, for that. And look, you, both of you women are beautiful. You can tell that you have the gift of joy and laughter and levity. Why are we going to, I mean, I remember going to a little old Baptist church and I'm not picking on the Baptist now and <laughs> salute to South Carolina and stand in line with these women had box of Kleenex. And when I'm handing me a wad, I said, for what? She said, we just love to come here and cry. I said, you know what? I'm going to leave here and laugh. Uh -huh. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and cry. I, wh why do I want to do that? So I really was convicted to share what I felt like my God-given gift was, and you all too, you got to go with what you know is in your heart and you can articulate and present. So that's important. Yeah. 
So, so let's go back to, we talk on this show, like we talk about this reset, rise and reveal of your brilliance. And clearly your brilliance is sharing your wisdom mixed with humor so that it, it, people relate. And I, I, you know, I do that as well, because I find if you can make people laugh, they remember, they remember what you're saying so and true. They, can get, they can get the message. But where did this come from? You know, we talk about the, the reset and that's usually the area of a sucker punch or a train wreck. And not everybody has a big sucker punch or a train wreck, but what in your background led you to kind of turn to humor? My mother was funny. She always would say to me, now find something funny in that. Mm -hmm. And she would always say that. In fact, my brother, bless his heart. You know, I'm fixing to say when a sucker <laughs> says, I know when Southern people say bless his heart, there's a coda to that. There's something it's, else. It's like we're already asking forgiveness in our very <laughs> subliminal way. But he is a great guy with a really bad problem. And it was drugs. You know, you all mentioned um, my brother's just struggled and I hate it for him. I really do. We've tried and tried and tried. But you got to want it badly enough to get some help mm -hmm. for it. But he's been yeah. married. Oh, five or six times. So my mother All right. always saw humor. She called me up and she said, have you met your brother's sixth wife? And I said, no. Do you know <laughs> I, went, I went, no. She said, oh, I do. I said, what mom, what's her name? Cleopatra. Cleopatra. <laughs> she said, yeah, she has to be the queen of denial. <laughs> and then mama called me up and said, you know, your brother's every single one of his wives is a first initial is a day of the week. Maureen's Monday, Tuesday's Terry, Wednesday's Wendy, Thursday's Terry again. That was repeat. Friday's Francis, oh Saturday's Sharon, the breeder. <laughs> Call her the breeder because she had the children. We think. But um, anyway, but you know, I loved all those women and they all have a special place in my heart and you have to make peace with it. And that was a, that was several, several years of being punched, sucker punched. But mama saw the, co the comedy and the humor in it. And that kind of helped me instead of saying, oh, poor little old me, you know, you can, and I always say you can be bitter or you could be better and you yeah. can knock that I out and put that E in there. Because when you mm -hmm. lift that word bitter and that big I, that's all about you and you're going to be bitter and nobody's going to want to be your friend. I mean, what horror not to have girlfriends, you know, or people. So mama was funny. She was funny. Oh, that's cool. So my uh my I didn't have much growing up but my dad could always find the funny he still does and the grandkids just like hover over him because he always has some wisecrack to come out that's hilarious but what I realized you know especially in talking with folks like you is my dad really came from nothing and a horrible environment so he took us one step up which wasn't that far however it was far enough that we were safe and and I guess his perspective was we had it great compared to how he grew up. So he was just joy, you know, all the time. But he always had us finding the funny. And I, I know that that's where I, I get that genetically from him. And it's a great, it's a great trait for when these sucker punches come to be able to find the funny or at least start smiling soon after that hit. I think when you have conclusion and you find a mess in your message or make uh, you're paying somebody else's gain you start it's like the blinders come off your eyes it's almost like a, a godly thank you Jesus moment when you can start seeing something good that you can take and process and then externalize it and you're so right Kristen that's that's real power right there and it seems like the more underprivileged Tom, my husband's a financial advisor and he said it's so weird the people he sees that have little or nothing and how grateful they are and we even heard a speaker last last year when we were in Arizona, and he's, he's uh, the happiness advantage. And I wish I, Sean, can't remember oh. Sean's last name, but what a great book. And it's just like, pick up the phone and hear this with this big old corporate New York Life event for the, I'm proud of Thomas as being one of the top producers. But um, here we are listening to this guy. And I mean, it's like, hey, call somebody and tell them, thank you. It's like, it was so simple. But yet people don't do that. They don't practice gratitude so that's part of it too is being thankful and and when you can find your own humor and tickle your own funny bone it's no disrespect meant to anything that happens there are tragedies everywhere yeah. we just had a terrible thing happen our good friends that are our church buddies and our children grew up with the oldest son's um 
son passed away from a neuroblastoma. We thought he licked it and it came back with a vengeance and he was gone in two days. Wow. And I've been on the phone with his grandmother and we've cried together and we should bear one another's burdens. But mm-hmm. I said something funny to Deborah uh, when I was talking to her and she just cracked up, you mm-hmm. know, she, and I was so good to hear her laugh a little bit, you know, and that, you know, I believe that's God's hug of saying, you're going to be okay. Oh my gosh. I, I so love hearing you say that because when my son was struggling with his addiction issues, dark humor was the place that I went all the time because it was almost like that, that pressure cooker. You, you need that little bit of a release. And it is that almost um, a, a, a tie, like a rope that, that goes back to the normal world. Like at some point, this is still part of your life. At some point you will be able to laugh again. You will find joy. And even in this moment of sadness, there are still those bits and pieces, whether it's a memory, whether it's a whatever, that can that can make you laugh. And that really is the lifeline. So true. That's so well said. And only someone who's journeyed through that, Mary Fran, can really understand that. And only like, and I told, first thing I told Deborah, I mean, my daughter's married and lives next door. Thank goodness we have a, a peach farm and she built a nice home and we're happy to have her a thousand yards from, from here. But um, I don't know what it's like to have grandchildren. I don't have a grandchild. And uh, I just, first thing I told Deborah, I'm not going to dare say I understand how you feel. What an insult. (laughs) No way. I mean, when my my mother died and my sister died back to back within five months, don't don't tell me you know how I feel until you've had that experience. So I think we have to be sensitive to meet people's needs where they are. And I said, Deborah, I don't know what to say. I just want to cry is what I want to do. I want to cry. And I want to, I just want to hug y'all and just, and just weep. And so, you know, just get real about it and don't try to act like you understand. And it's a gift in all of this when you can help other people. Um, I dated a guy for many years before I met Thomas and his sister's um, son had a, um, she was, he was anorexic and he passed away, a guy. Mm, Oh, wow. That's unusual. Unbelievable, because men don't do that. And I just remember listening to Susan and she said, I can't, I can't share it. I can't write it. I don't have conclusion because you don't want to get up on a stage or in a book and make it a therapy session for you. It can be therapeutic, no, no doubt. But you don't want to make the whole audience sit there and, and not get anything out of it except a very sad experience, you know. Yeah, so. I heard, um, I think it may have been Amy Porterfield, but I could be wrong that said about, you know, getting up on stage and sharing your message, share your scars not your open wound oh golly Hmm. that's brilliant isn't that brilliant oh man that's that's exactly it and then i read a quote i was listening to we were down um on the farm in charleston and i i saw andy stanley had a quote and it said if you don't deal with the demons in your heart they go into your soul and lift weights (laughs) oh That's, that's, I, I'm, I know that firsthand experience. Oh, goodness. That, yeah. And I think, you know, I think to that point, if you can immediately find, and again, not immediately, we're talking all due respect to the pain in this situation. I, I have a, a, a very, very dear friend who um, literally within the past couple of days just lost her, her handicapped son. Um, of he's 40 years old and, and was capable of doing nothing. And, and on one level, this, this is a release for all concerned, but you need to respect where people are, as you said, respect that pain, but then recognize that there is still light in it. There's always a little bit of light in, in there somewhere. And if you can at least look towards that, that doesn't mean it's going to make the pain go away. It doesn't mean it's going to make anything, but it's that, that little point of hope. That it's you, funny. You, know, you, you had a phone, phone on that. One of my best friend's husband was killed in a plane crash. Gosh, it's been 20 something years ago. She grieved so hard because she had raised three little girls. Mm. And I asked her, I said, Mary, when did you know you were getting better? She said, one day, one day, I didn't think about Charles for five minutes. Mm. And the next day it was six and the next day it was seven. Yeah. It was constantly on her mind, but grief is something. Yeah. It's a, it's a process. And, and I think when we respect all parts of that process, you know, people say sometimes when they're in the middle of grieving that they feel guilty for feeling good. 
But if you recognize that as humans, our processes are messy. They're not, they're not clean. You don't go from A to B to C to C. like, it's just this, it's a constant jumping back and forth. And if you can recognize that, hey, it's, it's okay to feel a little bit of lightness. It's okay to take that situation and make a joke that would cause some people who haven't gone through it to go, oh my God, how could you say that? But when you go through it, you find those points of, of light in the darkness. It's funny because my son, who, whom I've written books and things about, he'll say to people, I'm the only one of my mom's kids that she wrote a book about. <laughs> I'm like, dude, that's nothing to brag about. Like, don't brag about that. But it is that idea of finding humor and, and it's an equalizer for so many of us. And we can share in people's pain and bring a little bit of joy at the same time. Wait, well, <laughs> wait, this is totally reminding me, I think between the Southern accent on Jane and talking about <laughs> all of this stuff, my favorite movie of all time is Steel Magnolias. And when Dolly Parton says, laughter through tears is my favorite emotion. <laughs> when they <laughs> laugh at the funeral, they make they make a crack a joke or something. They all start laughing as they're sobbing. Oh, oh goodness, I love her. She there's a <laughs> documentary of her on. I think it's I can't remember if it's Netflix, Disney Plus, or something, but it's worth the watch. Is it's, it really? I haven't, oh, I haven't so even good. heard about this. Now oh, I know yeah. what I'm doing this weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's it's you know, she they were gonna put a statue up to her and she said, Don't do it. <laughs> she said I think I that want. statue, they'd have to do some balancing with that statue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would take some concrete. Probably <laughs> might fall over. I know. <laughs> okay. it. So, so with your work, mm -hmm. how did you, how do you take what you, your humor and your motivational messages and how do you make that general and yet specific enough to reach people? Because it has to be a general message, but you also have to put stuff in there that reaches people specifically where they are. I think the first thing when it comes to the process of, of speaking, which is starting to kick back in, I have a live presentation next week, but that's a, a wow. different. Yeah, it's different though what I'm doing. I kind of started feeling out the market and where, where I could fit in. But I, so what I do is I send out a questionnaire and I always ask about what do you want these folks to walk away with? I need to read about your organization and what are the ages? And um, tell me a little bit about the, the chemistry of the audience. Then I craft a program because I've got so much material that I just collect. I saw a special on Jerry Seinfeld the other night and it had all of his written jokes on like a street and it looked like tile and it went all the way down. He just writes everything down. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got some of that, but a lot of it is, you know, with Sirius XM with my, with the comedy they play on 97, which is a real gift because it's a royalty check. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Yay checks. <laughs> so I just go through and if I've got a really cute story about like I'm doing a, um, a healthcare group next week. So if I've got a really cute story about, you know, healthcare and uh, like when I was, I went to the nursing home and I, I'll tell it real quick, sang for a bunch of sweet super, super seniors and uh, one woman stood up and she could hardly stand, bless her heart, and was clapping. And, and I went over to her and said, thank you. She said, oh, honey, you was good. She said, <laughs> you see what I done? I said, I did. She said, you just don't know how difficult it is at my age to give anybody a standing ovulation. <laughs> Sorry, I just hit my microphone. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, you can sit too. That You don't have to stand to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but she was oh so, cute. so I, I patch that story in and then if I'm doing teachers I'll talk about my cousin Tedda you know in the south we got cut and everything Tedda <laughs> and she was um last day of teaching and a parent came up and got their fist in her face said I got a good mind knock your teeth down your goat woman and cousin Tedda said I'll save you the trouble she took out her dentures <laughs> So, so you see what I'm saying? I kind of pull from this and that and then put it in a presentation and just hope it works. <laughs> but you know, that brings out, a, that brings out um, a really good point. I mean, 
all of our life experiences, Mm -hmm. when you really look at them as a whole, so many of them have, I think every little one has little bits and pieces of wisdom that you can, that you can relate to people. And as you said, okay, think about where they are and where they live. And even if your, your life experiences are very different in terms of the details, your human experiences in terms of the emotions are things that people will like hook into. So, okay, I don't have that experience with, you know, with the, with your cousin, the teacher, but there's something in my world that relates to that. So it, when you, when you give someone the, the emotional level, mm-hmm. that's the human connection. And we talk about that with tribe. Krista and I talk about your tribe all the time. We're all a big tribe when you get right down to it at the end of the day. And I think you have to find stories that people, I mean, I can't talk about some stuff because nobody gets it. But the more common, you know, just like this morning, I thought maybe I'll call my humor coach and see if we got a story. These guys working, you know, you might can hear it. I hope you don't. But um, getting my kitchen countertops redone after 40 years. And so um, they rang the doorbell 20 minutes early. I came down in my pajamas and the poor guy was like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked in the mirror and I went, oh my gosh. So then the next time I saw him, I had like this on and another top and I'd brush my hair and he was he was kind of like so and then the next time I put on some makeup and I roll my hair and he, who are these women like, it, it was like levels of self-improvement and the last time when I'm all done up I felt like he was going to introduce himself and start over I don't think he knew I was <laughs> but I mean not that, that but see I mean I don't know if I can play on that story or not and maybe there's a point in there or um you know, have you ever thought of some one thing of someone and then all of a sudden you realize they're not the way they are? Or, you yeah. know, you, you might can play with something like that and have a little takeaway. I mean, that's what I like to do. I, have, I like to do takeaways. And, and I really don't consider myself a comedian. It's a humorist. Humorists tell stories and they set up drop downs where you can go, oh, okay, gotcha. I can take, take that away with me. So yeah. um, that's what I like to do. I think stories are the the number one human connector that people really relate to stories. I always, I end up when I'm out doing a lot of speaking about my blind sons and my sighted daughter, you know, I tend to, there's certain stories that resonate very well and makes the connection from sighted families to families with blind kids and all that. But then I'm like, my, my son was home from college and he did this thing with my daughter. And I was like, thank God you just did something funny because I really need new stories for my <laughs> keynote speeches. But he did, wait, I got to tell you real fast. This is how my house is. And this is how it relates to, I have sibling rivalry in my home with blind and sighted kids. My son came home from college and he had like finally gained the freshman 15 in junior year, plus a little COVID 15, which he needed to gain, right? So my daughter who's 16 says to him, oh, Michael, getting a little belly there, aren't you? You know, and he goes, oh, Carissa. And he touches her face, like, stop it. And he goes, and she had zits on her forehead. And he goes, oh, Carissa, how nice you have Braille on your forehead. <laughs> oh, After I stopped laughing three days later, I'm like, finally, new material for the speeches. Thank you very much, you weirdos. <laughs> yeah, that. That is something. Goodness. <laughs> I bet you, you have really got some incredible stories. I do. And you know, my Michael taught me a long time ago about how to use humor in a way that it, it drops the bias and the uncomfortable when people see his cane and he uses it brilliantly to draw. He's, it's very uncanny with him, how he draws everybody in as opposed to everybody going in the opposite direction with that white cane. It has been an extraordinary journey to watch him do it ever since he was little. Oh my goodness. He would be able to do that. And at 21 and he goes in, I was just on his campus at Penn state for his 21st birthday and met all of his roommates and best friends. And they all say that he just breaks all of that barrier down. The staff love him. He just has a unique quality and it's humor at the, at the core of it. We had a a young man who's brilliant uh, in high school. And I remember how funny he was and he was blind. And in oh, his wow. senior directory, he put, you had pet peeves and he put steps. <laughs> um, I mean, he had the funniest things, door frames. I mean, he just, and, and we all just loved him. He, and he, he didn't act disabled, which was beautiful. 
yeah. you know, and, and that's what we loved about him. And he became a very prominent disc jockey down in Florida, from what I understand. Oh, cool. But, yeah. And then I remember my good friend, and this is where NSA, I hope y'all can come, National Speakers is so, cre- is so precious to me. We have a speaker friend named W. Mitchell, and he was burned over 90% of his body in a motorcycle accident. And on top of that, um, he was in a plane when he finally got through the depression of the burn being so burned, he flew and he crashed and he was became paralyzed. So he's oh like confined God. to a wheelchair. And he oh. said, he has a point in his speech. He says, you know, before my accidents, I could do 10,000 things. He said, but now I can only do 9,000. Oh. Wow. So wow. He's phenomenal. That's, I love seeing him. That's so that, that's the kind of stuff that really it could put your life in perspective when someone else can share what they've dealt with. And it really does resonate with people. Like, you know, if you think you're having a bad day. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What are you complaining about today? Yeah, exactly. We, um, Kristen was shared with me one of your, I want to just make a little bit of a leap here because it does kind of tie in, but Kristen shared an Instagram post of yours with me. And my favorite movie of all time, is the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> just my absolute favorite. And you had an Instagram post up that said something to the effect of it's Glinda's, you know, th- little little line about you've always had the power, my dear. You just you just had to figure it out for yourself. Oh yeah. And and I think that um, you know when we use humor, it allows people to figure out that they're even in the darkness. There's there's light, and it becomes that great equalizer. It's, it's that thing when you can laugh with another person, there is an immediate connection. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all striving for. I think so too. I think that's very powerful when you can just enjoy your life, share it with somebody else, get your life lessons. And you can, I, I just think you can be a beacon for people. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I, uh, years ago I was speaking at a conference, I think it was Indiana and it was way off the beaten path of my topic. And it was, uh, we had a very hard family problem with our property and it ended up being a horrible lawsuit with people that we loved and it just flip flopped into a nightmare. And uh, I, I told the story about what happened and I didn't, you know, you, you speaking to a community of agricultural people and they're, they're very uh, laid back and a lot of them are not really emotional. Well, that was like five years ago. So I'm calling around different clients. I, find, I found out people are hungry to talk and maybe put you on their docket. A little bit of info, ladies, people are ready to, ready to book. I uh, might not be tomorrow, but they're going to put you on the list. But anyway, I was calling around and I introduced myself and this girl said, ah, Jane, I was in charge of that conference. I was, a, you know, the office manager. And she said, do you know that your program was the number one rated program and how much people enjoyed and appreciated? It was hard to hear what you said. Well, I didn't know that. So here's the point. We may never know the lives we touch. Never. But I guarantee you with the passion is still burning within us to do it. There are going to be people who benefit from what we have to say. And that's, I think that's the highest calling. That's, that's just flat out service to me. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do is to serve other people and use humor. Absolutely. That's the space that Kristen and I always, always tell people to go to when they're trying mm-hmm. to figure out what their brilliance is, mm-hmm. what their, you know, what their gift is. Find a way to be of service. And, you know, I think between the three of us, we have we've all realized that we can share our lessons through humor, but just that idea of serving someone else because your heart's in it. You know, as much as our brains are this wonderful gift, sometimes they get in the way. And I think when you serve with your heart, that's when you can figure out how to fit in that brilliance or find what that brilliance actually is. And I think also no gift is too small. I mean, we live in the country in a little rural section of South Carolina, and I can look out of this window and see our little church fellowship hall which was a Grange building. If you watch Little House on the Prairie, you know, wow. they had the Grange Society and all that. Well, my Aunt Naomi Herlong, I can see her house. She's since passed away. She could make a caramel cake like nobody's business. And she'd never even use a beater. She had to feel the consistency with her hand, the icing. She knew when it was ready. Wow. So we entered all these little contests. These folks around here before I was thought of. And they kept trying to win this, trying to win that. 
And little did she know that that contribution of that amazing caramel cake would be a prize winning cake, which led to more points, which led to that building. Wow. The Grange building, which became our church fellowship hall. So no gift is small. And a lot of people don't get that. They don't get it. No gift should be ungiven or too small. That's the way I look at it. That's that. amazing. I, I, and I, mm-hmm. it, it just speaks to so many of the things and those, those pieces of, we talk about not being married to outcomes. You, you, don't, mm-hmm. you don't start something. And then if you don't get to that exact place, think of it as a failure. No. Because, because you don't know. And you're, to, to your point, you don't know how whatever, if, if you put something out there with your whole heart and your passion and your belief and, and your authenticity, you just have to put it out there and then see where it goes. Just let it go. And you might not see where it goes. Like you well, said. Did you all think you'd be writing books? No. <laughs> oh <laughs> not my God. God. Jane, there, there, I always joke that when I did my first book two years ago, there are still English teachers in my hometown that need oxygen over the fact that Kristen <laughs> sat down and wrote it and didn't just get out of it by doing a speech. I was always like, can we just talk instead of doing a term paper? Let me tell you everything I know. And then I finally put wrote stuff down. But no, I never, I mean, I, was I got an F teacher. in college in writing. <laughs> Did you really? It, oh yeah. And the professor was lovely. He photocopied my horrible work and let everybody see it. <laughs> I sit right there. Well, now see, you were being of service. Well, years later, I was booked to speak at my college. <laughs> there he was. And I gave him my book. I said, thank you. Here you go. It wasn't ugly. It was a challenge. Why not? Oh my God. But you don't let people define you and you don't stop trying and you don't try stopping. And the best English word, four letter word in the English language is next. Because I mean, when my journey started, you know, I was, I just learned how to sing and I was in churches doing my little thing. And then people would say, oh, that was what you said. I said, what I said. So (laughs) that led to more, less singing, more speaking. Then that led to, that was funny. I said, that was funny. And then that led, do you have that written down? Do I have it? What? So (laughs) then that led to, you should try putting stuff on Sirius XM. You kidding. Jerry Seinfeld's on that, you know, and all these fabulous people and Shonda Pierce. I think me, there you go. And then you should try to get a good book deal. Me? So I'm just brave enough to look at no and say, bring it on. Let's just see what we can do with this little word. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I love the the best word is next. Oh yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole mindset shift in terms of something doesn't work out okay next yeah and don't stop stop would be the worst four letter word stop yeah but next is well you're not the right person that i'm i'm looking for and i don't want to take up your time and i don't you know i don't want to invade your busy day if you're not interested i'm good to go and i'll make notes don't contact this person they were honest i appreciated it don't waste my time i don't want to waste your time let's move on you know, it's funny when I was first in my divorce journey started four years ago, when I, I guess about three years ago, I was ready to start sort of ready to start dating again in my late forties. Thank you very much. And I was talking to look other- 20. Great. Day. Oh, it's oh don't, don't feed her ego, please. It's all the lighting. But at any rate, <laughs> I was talking with another speaker at this big rare disease conference that we were both speaking at. We were waiting for the train to come home and he had been through divorce and was dating again and was actually engaged. And I'm like, oh my God. How did you even go about this? And he goes, Kristen, you gotta, you gotta get out there. You gotta fail early and fail often. <laughs> that was his <laughs> approach that he gave me. And I was like, oh, but it's that same thing of, okay, this one didn't work next. Not, and, I'll, and we'll work through all of, you know, the baggage I was bringing in all of that. And I saw them years later and I thanked them because it was, it was, it is great advice to go into stuff like that. Not be married to the outcomes, fail early, fail often. And next What's coming now? That's the kind of people I hang out with, all my good speaker buddies, and that are honest enough and not trying to impress you with this and that. They'll tell you, oh, that was an epic fail. <laughs> <laughs> we'll laugh about it, you know. <laughs> it's just and everybody has them. You know, everybody's oh, yeah. got that experience. Again, that's uh, that's that great that great equalizer. But the idea that you, you know that you just put out there. We try to tell people all the time, you can't be married to your plan because how many times does that ever work? 
Oh, goodness. You know, so you go out there and you put something out there and you are open to whatever the evolution is and look in your life with what you said, where all those things led. Well, and then with this pandemic, I think we're all so tired of it, but um, I did get a shot last week. I was so happy. I'm not old enough, but I just got in line and I said, y'all got any leftovers? And they said, yeah. I said, bring it on right here. <laughs> I got my shot. But um, the thing is, because of all of this, and I started really thinking and, and listening to people and what do people want? And I thought, you know what? They want to laugh. They want some hope and they want to be entertained. So I called my good friend who's our church pianist, who is just a ball of fun and what talent. And I said, Hey, Margaret, let's do a show. And I'm going to call it sweet tea tunes, Southern fried humor. And it's a takeoff on my tagline. Mm -hmm. So I just called my good friend at the Methodist church about 20 miles from here and said, Hey, we were in college together. I said, Hey, Beverly, I know you do the senior crowd. We need some practice. And she said, say no more. When do you want to come? So then that led to a, another friend of mine calling me who was head of all the technical colleges. And I'm on a technical college board here. And, uh, and I said, he said, we want you to come do your thing. I said, let me pitch something to you. And he went, yes, 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 yes. So next week we're doing our musical review. <laughs> and oh it's my gosh. really fun, but you see, I'm not even, and then I got another, I'm not even advertising. And I'm going, oh my gosh. I, I told, I told Margaret, I said, Margaret, I hope your husband's on board because this thing is, could fly super high. We just don't know where it could lead. I haven't even advertised it. And I've got three bookings. Wow. Oh my but gosh. Just because people want comedy, hope, humor, music. And yeah. if, if you hit on the older crowd now, a lot of them have been inoculated and they're ready to roll. They're ready to have somebody come in and laugh with them. So I just saw what I felt like the market was doing. Yeah. We'll see, we'll see where it goes. Oh, that's yeah. cool. That's, that's how we approach this thing too. When, when, as soon as the world shut down and we were like, we know how to go on online and do virtual presentations. We have yeah. a good banter between us. Well, let's still try to do our show, but let's do it online. And quite frankly, nobody cared about the lighting, about my hair. My hair went berserk. I couldn't get into a salon for like four months. So I was in like Phillies hats, Eagles hats. People were chiming in. You haven't worn that hat in a while. Like they didn't care if it was perfect or not. Oh, we because it was real. Talking. Yeah. And we were being of service. And honestly, we always say we started the show to help everybody else. It was to help me. I was losing my mind. <laughs> I was losing my mind with three kids and trying to figure it all out and COVID and crazy ex-husband and had everything like, like a crazy storm. But then we started meeting all these different guests, giving strategies and their own stories. And it has just evolved into something phenomenal. Well, I love y'all's podcast, you know, and I went on and, and read up what I felt like would be a good match. I was so impressed with what you all were offering folks. And I said, that's what I want to do. And I started my own podcast, but I, didn't, I just didn't feel like it after a while. I thought I'm just not, I'm not disciplined enough. I want to go to lunch. My 80, year old, my 80 year old best friend just got married. You talk about something interesting. Good grief. That's actually a very good point though. Don't feel like you have to be doing what everybody else is doing. Oh yeah. It I'm might not be your thing. Like if it's not your thing, don't do it. That's what we talk about. If it's not your brilliance, don't do it. Yeah. You're wasting your time trying to make something your brilliance, you know, with it. I mean, even stuff around here, I'm very unorganized and I'm, um, you know, but when I get organized, I get mixed up. Like, where did I put that? I know. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's not my gift and I don't care, you know, and I don't. And so to me, why am I wasting my time trying to be something I'm not? I think you should work on your strengths rather than your weaknesses many times because it gobbles up your weakness. Yeah. You know, because I mean, it'd be torture for me to go, oh, I got to straighten out these drawers. You know, and I'm thinking, nah, I'll figure it out another time. But yeah, I just think when you try to be something you aren't, you're going to, you're going to fail. And it's not going to be a good thing. Well, and that's, that's so the best great. part of this dynamic duo is Mary Fran is very much like, no, I don't do that. <laughs> no, because I said when we first started, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I think that we should have like, wear the same color and have a certain color. And I go through this whole thing and she goes right up in the camera of her Zoom and she goes, um, no, <laughs> I don't do that. 
<laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not going to go to the mall with you and walk around wearing the same outfit and end up at Claire's. No. We're going to get mm -hmm. the same. We're going to get our ears pierced up. Here. I you know? <laughs> so I talked her yeah. into, into the banners behind us. I'm like, Can we okay, now, that's a good backdrop? one. That's, that's goes, good. Okay, fine. And I like, know what works yeah. and what don't, I don't do it. <laughs> no, you get, you get that age where you, yeah, exactly. People, that's exactly what it is, Jane. Yeah, I'm like, it's age. No, you get, uh -uh. no, no. She's so like, funny. she's like way younger than me. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> she just goes, what? Come on. No, next, oh. Jane, next. <laughs> I know me. I will, it will be a big flop. I know me. <laughs> and I've, I've learned. And now I say, instead of saying, Mary friend, you've got to get on Twitter. I just got her password so I can go on her Twitter. <laughs> I ain't going on the tweeter. That's what she said. I ain't going on the tweeter. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I, doing that's, it. That's one of my to dos today. Is I got to, I, I let go all my people when COVID hit because I had automatic drafts and I'm going, uh uh, I'm not <laughs> tighten this belt. And so I'm looking at all these different people. And I mean, I'm going to be super picky. They probably going to hate me. But I mean, I'm the whole time I'm thinking, you know, when the whole thing started, I'm thinking, why are we on social media? There's, there's nothing. I mean, unless you have real interesting, uh, I've just learned so much. Uh, that's another reason for you all. I'm just going, you know, if you can get involved with the speaking world, like there is so much information. I mean, just last week I learned how to send a nine word email that works a nine word email. Wow. Is your God. Nuances of just, you know, go, go to this website. Um, what people want or what people are searching for. And then you can see topics for your blogs, your podcast, you know, it's all free. I'm going, wow. what? So, you know, wow. the, the resources you can be working on stuff while you're not actively on the platform. Because when you travel, it's a lot. You've got yeah. to get mm -hmm. your ducks in a row when you have children, Christian, that's really hard. Yeah. And then you got to set that up and then, you know, get your flight, get your this, get your that get your material shipped out if you have stuff to sell. I mean, it, 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 it really is consuming. It's, it's not, people think, oh, you make what and speak for how long? And I'm thinking, yeah, you have no idea what goes in behind that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, a lot of reading, a lot of crafting, and a lot of packing and shipping and communication with the sound people. I mean, if you want to do a good job, you, you do a good job. So people can, and, and then my greatest uh, you know, testimonials, easy to work with, extremely professional. Yay. I'll take that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And my, uh, my oldest son is a sound guy. <laughs> when I am oh. out at events, I go right to the sound guys and give them every ounce of gratitude. Cause I know no kidding. They make all the difference in, 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 uh, presentations a lot They'll of make time. or break you. Yeah. Can, yeah and I know the, 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 um, effort that they put in the good ones. That, yeah. uh, and I'm so appreciative of it now seeing it on the, on the back end from Michael. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and then I just went ahead and, and I'm, I've got three sound systems and they're good sound. They're Bose. So I, I, you know, I'll take that with me next week and they'll be, have a complete sound system. It's almost like a dinner theater, but I still don't trust it. I mean, I'm Jimmy told me my, the client. So that I, I do that too. I fly with equipment sometimes, not the big heavy stuff, but yeah, I want it to be excellent, you know, so yeah, I'm yeah. going to make it excellent. Yeah. That's amazing. Jane, this has been a, a, such a great conversation. And I think just what we, uh, we needed it. I needed it. I needed a little bit of light and laughter in my life. There's been a lot of stuff. Everybody's got a lot of stuff going on. So when you yeah. can meet somebody like you, who just brings the light, it's, it's such a gift. So thank you for that. And tell everybody where we can find you because we all need some of Jane oh, Jenkins you're too Herlong sweet, Mary friend. Thank <laughs> you. So my website is janeherlong.com, H-E-R-L-O-N-G.com. If anyone would like to get something, uh, I'd like to give away a gift, and it's my comedy and my humor and a couple of downloads, they can go to janeherlong.com forward slash gift, G-I-F-T, singular. Or if you want contact info, Jane Jenkins, her long forward slash contact. And if you fill that in and send it to me, I'll put you on my mailing list for my new, I'm going to put y'all on my newsletter mailing list. Oh, yes, yes, please do. Absolutely. My, my new thing this, uh, this week is talking about my ADHD son <laughs> who's 32 and still in college. Did you hear me say that everybody? <laughs> 
And then I'll tell you a funny little story. Got time for one. Sure. Of course. Yeah. So I go, you know, we're so small. Our country club is our grocery store. It was Bilo <laughs> and they're gone. Now we got this place called KJ's. I, I never can pronounce. I don't know. I call it something else, which is not appropriate um, <laughs> because it has jelly at the end. I should not do that. That is so wrong. I call it that. So I, can't, I call that forever. So sorry. That was inappropriate. So um, I can't help it. So um, <laughs> I'm in the grocery store and because all I got the little perfect women who have the perfect children my age. Hi, Jane. Hello. And I'm getting my, of course, I got the squeaky wheel buggy. Of course. <laughs> of course, you know. <laughs> and what's Ham's doing? And I said, oh, he's still at Clemson. Really? <laughs> and I'm going. <laughs> I was just trying. I said, he's getting his PhD. <laughs> oh, well, I, I didn't tell him it stood for Pizza Hut delivery. <laughs> I mean, why not? They don't need to know. No. <laughs> well, my mom always said, all sick don't tell doctor. Nobody has to know anything. So. <laughs> well, thank you for making us laugh. What a gift you have been today. And everybody, I always turn it over at the end of the show to Kristen because she tells everybody where to find stuff because I can't keep all that in my head. So go. <laughs> Well, y'all have a great thing for. going. Y'all have a great thing going. Thank y'all for doing this. Well, Thanks it's so much pleasure. for being here, Jane. And everyone, go check out our website after you visit Jane's and get on her mailing list because you have got to get the dose of humor in your life from Jane every week. And then go to brilliantlyresilient.net. See our brand spanking new website that we have been working on and are so proud of. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Um, <laughs> Check out all the fun. Wait till you see the new header. It is the best picture of us. We are <laughs> so just funny. We are just using our brilliance all over there. But uh, check out brilliantresilient.net and we will see you all again next time. Bye.